All right, well, good morning and uh, Happy New Year to you. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit this morning about uh, the role of the environment. We don't talk about this a lot. We talk a lot about prevention of ventilator associated pneumonias and bloodstream infections and UTIs. Uh, but this is a, uh, again, a topic we probably don't talk as much about as we should. Uh, and I would imagine that for those of you taking boards, there might be some nuggets in here, uh, nuggets of gold, and talk about mining, you know, little nuggets uh, that might uh, uh, certainly come in handy to you. I do, uh, I'm not too conflicted. I, I only speak for two companies, uh, Cubist and, uh, and then one of the vaccine uh, manufacturers, Santofi Pasteur. And our objectives this morning are listed on your handout. We'll talk about the organisms most likely to be spread uh, uh, in three different ways. One is by fomites, one is through the air, <clears throat> and then the last one is through, uh, through the water, which we, again, don't talk a lot about. Uh, so I must always like to start off with a case. This was a case recently admitted to the uh, Hematology Oncology Service. An 80-year-old female was admitted from a nursing home. She'd been there about two weeks after uh, having a, uh, a fall at home and having a hip fracture, which was repaired here. Um, while at the nursing home, she began to experience some cough, uh, simulants, and altered mentation. She uh, had some comorbidities, which included congestive heart failure, hypothyroidism, and a right lung mass that was uh, due to squamous cell uh, carcinoma. Her admission chest x-ray revealed right upper lobe infiltrate, and she was admitted for evaluation. On exam, uh, after admission, she was a frail older female, no acute distress. She was not febrile. Uh, ENT exam was, uh, was unremarkable. Her chest was uh, clear uh, to oscillation percussion. Cardiac uh, sounds were normal. She was paced. Uh, abdomen was unremarkable. Skin, no rashes or petechiae, no venous cords. Uh, she was disoriented on her admission uh, H&P. Cranial nerves grossly intact and she had some uh, leg weakness. Pertinent labs on exam, white count 9700, maybe a little bit elevated, uh, but no particular uh, uh, diagnosis on the, on the shift there. Uh, slightly anemic at 10.4 grams. Uh, compared to her prior labs from here, she was a little bit azotemic on admission with BUN of 28 and creatinine of 1.23, and her calcium level was a little bit uh, elevated. Your analysis was remarkable for two plus leukocyte esterase, 20 to 50 white cells, and some bacteria were noted on the admission UA. Uh, MERSA and VRE screens were negative. CT scan done without contrast revealed no acute uh, abnormality. Her admission chest x ray, uh, again, I think we can all agree that there is a, uh, a right upper lobe uh, process here. It didn't bring the lateral, but uh, uh, and she had had an x-ray which was somewhat similar to this uh, in the not too distant past. She was treated empirically for UTI with the recephin. Uh, no organisms actually grew from the uh, urine culture. She was hydrated and had improvement in her mentation. And then over the next couple of weeks, uh, she was somewhat tenuous in her um, uh, ability to breathe and also to, to be able to get up and walk and uh, without uh, becoming short of breath. Um, she did, uh, th those, those uh, particular signs and symptoms didn't improve. A 2D echo suggested severe pulmonary hypertension. And so the pulmonary service was consulted to do a BAL just to see if there was something that might be reversible. And her, uh, her chest x-ray uh, at that time, uh, she ha had gone ahead and, and had some difficulties with congestive heart failure. Uh, and if we put these two x-rays up side, side by side, there's really not a, not a lot of change in that right upper lobe uh, density. Subsequently, the BAL revealed greater than 15 white cells per low-powered field. AFB stains were negative. There were a few yeast uh, seen on the uh, fungal stains. The day following the BAL, her shortness of breath increased. Uh, discussion uh, went on with the family and decided that she would be transferred to palliative care, where she passed away uh, quietly with her family the following day. Her BAL cultures grew oropharyngeal flora on the bacterial cultures, were negative for Legionella and for CMV. However, her fungal cultures grew Aspergillus fumigatus, and so. Uh, 
at this point, she had been in the hospital for approximately 20 days. And uh, what our team does, Aspergillus, uh, if you have one case of nosocomial Aspergillus, it's considered uh, an outbreak. So uh, uh, this case, like uh, in, any other positive uh, sputum culture or BAL culture for Aspergillus, is looked at with scrutiny by our team to see whether this might be, um, you know, whether the patient may have brought it in and was just diagnosed late uh, or whether the patient may have actually acquired the infection while in the hospital. Um, that, that fungal culture was from the BAL? For the BAL, yes, right. Um, our hospital policy suggests that if, you know, with bacteria we talk about, if someone comes in, we have sort of like a, it's sort of a gray zone, but 48, 72 hours. After that point in time, uh, we, we own that infection. It's considered to be one that may be hospital or acquired or healthcare associated. Uh, prior to that, uh, you know, MRSA bacteremias and different things that come in from the outside were probably uh, community acquired. For fungi, because they grow more slowly, uh, our hospital, like many others, uses a five-day rule instead of a two-day rule. So again, she was 15 days past the, uh, the five-day rule. We looked around to see whether there'd been any construction going on in the area. That's, an, uh, that's the, the prime uh, cause of aspergillus spores circulating in the air. Um, and uh, we, we did not have any going on in that particular area. Uh, aspergillus is not spread person to person, so these patients are not placed on any type of, uh, of isolation, but they do acquire, again, if you acquire it in the hospital, you inhale it from some aerosolized source. The place that you usually find it, again, it's either construction and you have disruption of whatever's in the walls and aspergillus spores will circulate. Uh, the other possibilities are uh, water, uh, anytime you have water. If you have a moist, uh, if your filters uh, coming in, filtering all the air coming in the hospital get moist, uh, as they may do, uh, and these are looked at very carefully, particularly after, say, a hurricane like Irene, to make sure those, those filters are not, uh, are not wet. So, uh, and this is just uh, routine uh, maintenance that goes on. And of course, these, these infections may be fatal. In this case, we don't know that this actually caused her fatality. Uh, to prove that someone actually has an aspergillus pneumonia, you, you really need to do a biopsy because it is an invasive infection. So in this case, she may have just been, been colonized. Other airborne infections that we concern ourselves with, of course, are more routine, uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis, pandemic flu, measles, rare cell zoster, and then we always have the other category, things like smallpox would fit into, and that's why we use the airborne precautions with the N95 mask. And I think we, we have a current challenge with a patient with TB who's walking around and not closing his door, I heard last night. So, um, so certainly these are the more routine organisms we're concerned about uh, with uh, airborne spread. Other possibilities, Bordetella pertussis, uh, we did have a peach case just before Christmas. Uh, who was not isolated uh, until the diagnosis was made, and we've got 12 healthcare workers right now under surveillance to uh, make sure they don't uh, actually come down with an infection with, uh, with whoop and cough. Non-pandemic flu, Neisseria meningitis. Uh, seems like if there's a case of Neisseria meningitis in the ED, everybody in the county wants, uh, wants some prophylaxis, and of course it's really those that just have face-to-face -face contact. Pneumonic plague and then RSV uh, in the particularly in the pediatric population. In this case, the droplets of the organisms are large enough that we can use droplet precautions with a surgical mask rather than the N95 mask. Now, the things we do to prevent airborne uh, healthcare associated infections in addition to the use of masks and so forth, one is to make sure that our heating and air conditioning systems are up to date, the filters are not uh, damaged uh, by water. The Joint Commission does require that uh, any time construction goes on, the infection control is, uh, is informed and uh, one or more of our team members will go up and take a look. Uh, and uh, the hospital's doing much better with that than they were uh, five or 10 years ago. Uh, there's also testing of the, of the air quality, call it non-viable air testing, just, just to see what kind of particulate matter is circulating in the air. That's done routinely by plant ops. Then for uh, uh, particular rooms, you have certain air exchanges that occur in each, uh, each room. Uh, portable HEPA filters are on the oncology, uh, available particularly on the oncology unit, but for any neutropenic patient, and uh, those are portable and movable. And then finally, if your patients go to the operating room, those rooms are actually under positive pressure to push the air out so that <clears throat> infected particles can't get in. 
and uh, they have a certain number of air exchanges that are required there as well. So uh, we do have all these things going on to uh, attempt to prevent uh, airborne infections. Let me just stop and see, does anybody have any questions about the airborne uh, component? All right, well, let's go on and talk a little bit about fomites. I remember hearing about fomites in medical school. We always made all kinds of jokes about uh, fomites. And of course, now with computers and handheld devices, we have more fom potential fomites than we, than we did when I was in medical school. The uh, organisms, uh, virtually any bacteria that's in the hospital can be a, serve as a source of infection to others through a fomite. But the ones that we think about and worry, worry about and wring our hands about most uh, commonly are the ones listed here. The, Clostridium difficile, uh, certainly enterococcus, and then we have our gram negatives. Uh, of course, we have a lot of gram negatives, but these are the ones that are uh, most concerning the uh, Pseudomonas acinetobacter, serratia, Klebsiella, and particularly a component of those, of course, are multi drug uh, resistant organisms. Your gram positives, again, if you have a, a group A strep, nosocomial group A strep, uh, that's, a, that's an outbreak, in one case, uh, constitutes an outbreak. But the more common organisms, of course, are routine Staph aureus and, and MRSA. Uh, among the viruses, norovirus is really the, uh, the one that we're concerned about the most. And we have had uh, certainly spread of norovirus from patient to healthcare worker and, uh, and to other patients, as have almost all hospitals uh, across the country when you have a, a big norovirus uh, outbreak. We were alerted about uh, a little over 10 years ago by one of our uh, former presidents of the Hospital Epi Society, John Boyce, uh, up in New England, had uh, published a paper. Uh, shorter papers have been published earlier, but he really uh, did a very nice uh, study with his crew in which they looked at uh, patients with MRSA, 38 consecutive patients with MRSA. They sampled uh, different surfaces in the room, such as the countertops, bed rails, uh, light switches, door handles, and so forth. And they found that 27% of the surfaces in the rooms were contaminated with, with MRSA. If a patient had MRSA in a wound or urine, it jumped to 36%. Uh, and if it was uh, in some other site, it was lower. It was only, only 6%. They also cultured uh, gowns and gloves of healthcare workers who had been <clears throat> in and out of the rooms and found that 65% of the nurses who had performed patient care uh, activities with MRSA uh, in a patient who either had a wound or UTI, they, they had either their gowns or gloves were contaminated uh, or their uniforms contaminated with MRSA. And then 42% of healthcare workers <clears throat> who had no direct contact with the patients but had touched contaminated surfaces. So for example, when you take a large team into a room, um, the attending and student, or student or the resident may actually be examining the patient, but the other folks in the room uh, their uh, gloves and gowns were cultured, and uh, if they touched any surface, such as a bed rail, you know, leaned up against the counter or something, uh, they also could be contaminated with MRSA as well. And this is a slide just showing the, uh, the breakdown by bar graphs of the different surfaces that were contaminated in that particular study. Uh, as you see, the floor bed linen and patient gowns were very, uh, certainly well, well up, approaching 50%. You had other areas, though, the, uh, the overbed table that's used to pay, place the patient's uh, food on, as well as a lot of other items. Uh, blood pressure cuffs, side rails, uh, uh, the bath door handle, infusion pump button, and, and room door. So in each of these cases, certainly contamination uh, uh, could occur. There have been other studies published between 97 and the present, but this was just published from the uh, Johns Hopkins Hospital by uh, my counterpart up there. And they looked at their pediatric uh, emergency department and found that there was MRSA contamination of uh, various sites. Uh, and we have various places here, pediatric treatment room, pediatric nursing station, um, urgent care, and adult triage. And in each case, there were MRSAs were detected on the desk, keyboard, phone, keyboard, and keyboard. So uh, again, there's a lot of in literature in between these uh, uh, 13, 14 years in between that show that uh, contamination can occur. If we move on to uh, an organism such as vanc resistant uh, enterococcus, uh, studies published uh, about four years ago in Britain suggested that 94% of the rooms of patients that had VRE infection or colonization had uh, one or more positive environmental cultures. Let me just pull this up here. 
So they divide it up into, uh, they have uh, bed rails, bedside tables, phones, call buttons, toilets, and uh, door handles. And so uh, uh, when the patient was discharged from the room, they did swabs and found that, again, a number of these were positive, approaching 70% for the bed rails, for example, and as low as about 10% for the uh, door handle on the room. They did uh, routine cleaning and found that 71% of those services were still positive, just routine cleaning done by their environmental staff. And then they went to the extra um, step of using 10% bleach cleaning and then reduced that down to, to zero. So, and a uh, fairly dramatic example here, this was a uh, call button on one of the rooms. And so it had been cleaned already by, routinely by their environmental surface fo uh, service folks and they cultured uh, VRE, and there's a lot of, a, lot of a lot of colonies there you can see on that plate. So VRE, and as you'll see in a few minutes, CDF are two of the biggest offenders of, of uh, contaminating the environment. You may say, well, gee, uh, Dr. Ames, that's great uh, that, that we know that, but can we, is there anything you can do to actually uh, show that, that some effect of uh, cleaning <clears throat> of these rooms can actually reduce uh, infections or colonization? And again, uh, Recently published again from the Brits, uh, studies done between 2005 and 2008. They have the uh, uh, patients with positive, uh, the, the solid line here, patients with positive colonization, and the re red line are actually clinical cultures. And then the hatch bars across here show the uh, different, uh, they did point prevalent studies looking at uh, colonization uh, in the rooms. And they found, uh, again, a number of times when you had high patient loads, you had high contamination of the rooms. They did some intervention here, which included uh, some increased level of cleaning as well as education of the nursing and house staff. And as you see, these colonization rates fell, infection rates fell, and the numbers of contaminated areas in the rooms fell. So it's a nice correlation where an intervention actually reduced uh, not only the counts in the room, but actually result in decreased numbers of infections. If you look at uh, C. diff, uh, this is done by the same group that we showed you before, and you'll recognize the uh, same type of slides. Um, nine of nine patients with uh, Clostridium difficile associated uh, diarrhea had positive cultures after routine cleaning, seven of nine or 78 percent. Then they came in with a bleach, and, uh, and except for uh, with one exception, they were able to, uh, to clear the room of contamination. Of course, C. diff is a, a big challenge. It has uh, spores which are not killed by the Purell or the alcohol in the Purell that we use. So you actually have to take advantage of the soap and uh, detergent uh, activity to actually kill the spores. We've had our own experience at times with uh, culture in the environment. We do these uh, whenever we feel like there's an indication to, to do so. And uh, this, many of you may recall, about 18 months ago, we had a multi-drug resistant acinetobacter outbreak in the surgical ICU, and that resulted in us cohorting a bunch of patients, some with infection, some with colonization, with this uh, MDRO acinetobacter, which had all R's on the, uh, on the antibiogram. I think, uh, I think it was susceptible to colistin, but uh, for some of the patients, that was, that was too late. Uh, but... Um, Went up and did some environmental cultures of the uh, one part of the SICU, which is, again, basically an acinetobacter unit for about four or five days. And as shown in orange are the positive environmental cultures and in green, the negative cultures. So uh, Bill Cleave uh, put this together for us. And uh, R is respiratory equipment, S is sink, and C is um, are the countertops. And so basically, uh, as you see, the uh, respiratory equipment here, sink and countertop in this room, Restore equipment, countertop, sink and countertop. Now the good news about this is it didn't get out. Uh, the uh, keyboards, and you recall the setup in the ICUs is you have one, uh, um, <clears throat> they're set up in two, pa two patients with a central uh, area for the keyboards and, uh, and the desk and so forth. So it didn't get out. It didn't also get out into the common areas in, the, in that particular pod. So, so we've had our own experience uh, uh, with environmental cultures as well. It's probably not a great leap of faith then to understand why we recommend what we do, and certainly uh, hand hygiene is very, very important. You, the importance of washing your hands before going in a room, the importance of washing your hands afterwards. The World Health Organization actually takes a little different and higher level approach, and they talk about the five 
moments or opportunities for hand hygiene. And it kind of makes sense if you go in a room in a patient who's not on isolation, but uh, perhaps they have a surgical wound or some type of a decubitus or something that needs to be examined, you're, you're probably going to want to wash your hands after you, uh, first of all, if you touch the bed rails or something, you want to wash your hands before you uh, take that dressing loose, but you certainly want to wash your hands after you take the dressing loose. Um, and then also the use of contact precautions uh, using gloves and gowns. Sometimes there's some interpretation of what this actually means, but our hospital policy says if you cross the threshold of the room, you should put on gloves and gowns uh, for that, uh, that encounter. Now, and of course, I'm, many times I've asked by attendings, I know Ricky Watson asked me this from family practice, he said, he said you know, Keith, I've got a bunch of, t I, I may take 10 or 12 people in the room with me on rounds. Do we all need a gown and glove? And I said, absolutely. Well, the idea is a lot of times you get in a room and you do things you don't anticipate. You might go over, like say, lean on the, on the bed rail or touch the bed rail or, or lean up on the, on the counter or something. And in that case, you may inadvertently contaminate your, if you have not gown and glove, you may inadvertently contaminate your hands or, or clothing and then pass that on to a patient one or two rooms down. So I think administration certainly would, would rather spend more money on gowns and less money on, on secondary infections. So that's the, uh, the rationale behind what we, what we recommend. Any questions about fomites? Yes, sir. Nathan. They sure were, as soon as we detected, you know, that they had an infection. We also, in, in that case, we had actually swabbed uh, noses and rectums on those patients and, and actually found some carriers. So anyone who was either colonized or infected, wrong contact. So I'm sure that helped keep those keyboards and common areas clean. Yes, absolutely, and that's a that's a certainly a challenge. The laboratory is uh, we worked with the lab to uh, so that you get a flag anytime your patient has an MDRO. Have we tweaked that? We we talked about it, John, uh, Dr. Christie's back here. Have we we tweaked that again? Uh, I know we had our meeting last month, and we 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 tweaked the definition just a little bit as the literature has suggested that we should. So, any other questions about fomites? All right, the last part we'll talk about is water. We don't really talk about this very much, but so I think this, a lot of this information will probably be new to you. But, um, you know, when you think about it, uh, Greenville Utilities, their goal in, uh, in keeping us, uh, providing us with a safe water supply is to prevent coliforms. Uh, Dr. Shack and I talk about, you know, poop bugs, E. coli, to keep those out of the water supply. And some of you may recall about three or so years ago, the, the water supply was shut down for a couple of days because some coliforms were detected somewhere within the system, and it, it wasn't, wasn't just PCMH, it was the whole water system. Some of y'all may recall when that happened, so we had to use uh, bottled water and so forth for a couple of days until they straightened that out. Uh, but there have been, uh, if we cultured uh, the water with proper uh, media and so forth, if we, if we go looking, we'll find uh, uh, organisms in the water. Some of those may be pathogenic, and, and, and some of these, many of them may are, are not, but certainly some are actual pathogenic, and there have been disease outbreaks have been associated with hospital water. Uh, mycobacteria, we know mycobacterium avium, for example, is in uh, all of our water supplies. And so uh, there have been outbreaks associated with some of the other atypical mycobacteria. Dr. Ashraf here uh, has presented a paper on uh, a little small cluster that we had with uh, mycobacterium uh, mucogenicum several years ago, and uh, I think he'll be writing that up pretty soon, right, Ashraf? <laughs> Uh, in collaboration with Dr. Lyles and, and the Oncology Service. Um, Legionella, uh, we think about Legionella as in, inhaled, but it actually is in the water supply, particularly in these blind loops of, uh, of pipes that can be present in, in older facilities. And uh, there were outbreaks uh, back in the 70s that were detected. Uh, when Jimmy Carter was president, uh, uh, some of the attendings may recall when uh, we had the original uh, energy crisis in 1973, and then when Jimmy Carter became president in 76, they decided to uh, save uh, money and oil by reducing the, the temperatures on all water heaters throughout the entire federal system. And then uh, shortly thereafter, there were, there were Legionella outbreaks in, in both Pittsburgh and uh, the Wadsworth VA out in Long Beach, California. 
in which veterans who took showers uh, ended up with nosocomial legionella uh, pneumonia. And so now, of course, the, uh, the water is actually kept at a, uh, higher temperatures, and that's regulated as we do here uh, to try to prevent those types of uh, outbreaks from occurring. And then our old friends, Pseudomonas, Aeromonas, Stenotrophomonas uh, uh, outbreaks, cluster outbreaks, have been implicated, the water source has been implicated with a number of uh, outbreaks at hospitals and healthcare facilities. At PCMH, uh, we were looking, uh, as we do, uh, we compile data uh, all the time, and so we we're looking at our infections from 0809. This was after the impact of the MRSA um, search and destroy uh, program. And as you see here, uh, just a very broad view, this includes all the device related infections, ventilator associated pneumonias, central line associated infections, and UTIs. And it's shown in the uh, sort of the lavender color or the fungi, uh, those are mostly uh, Canada. Uh, and in the darker bars are the gram negatives, and the, the lighter bars are the gram positives. And so this is sort of an overall view of the types of uh, infections by, uh, by gram stain and, uh, and fungi categories. The reason the gram positive is so low is that the, uh, the impact of the MRSA program by the fourth quarter of 2007, uh, this is the Central Atlantic uh, VHA co cooperative and uh, these hospitals are coded, but we're down here, we're, we're FQ. Uh, we have the lowest MRSA rate in the entire region by the end of 2007, of course, and that, that's remained low. So most of our, our hospital-associated uh, ground positives now are, are actually routine staph aurea, so not, uh, not MRSA. If you look at a, bar, at a pie graph, we see that the gram negatives account for over 50% or did uh, in 2008-9, uh, over 50% of our healthcare-associated uh, infections. I had our team uh, break down these infections by organism. I said, give me the top five in each category. So if you look at the ventilator associated pneumonias, for example, uh, Pseudomonas is number one, uh, Klebsiella two, Staph aureus, H flu, and then we had some residual MRSAs, particularly in the surgical ICU where patients came in and went straight to surgery, were placed on a ventilator and didn't get the benefit of screening and the Pearson prior to uh, uh, their admission. Central line associated infections, enterococcus was leading the pack, but similar numbers of Klebsiella pneumonia, Count albicans, Staph hepi, and Pseudomonas. And then for UTIs, of course, E. coli uh, predominates because most folks with E. coli UTIs are actually infected by their own uh, flora, but Pseudomonas was a very close second, Canada, enterococcus, and Klebsiella. So if you go over here to all infections and you exclude uh, E. coli, basically, uh, three of your top four there are all waterborne type uh, infections, Pseudomonas and uh, Klebsiella and Enterobacter. So we call this little project of ours in search of gram negatives and we'll, we'll walk through how we, how we look for these and what we, uh, what we found. Our initial question was what's the source of these, uh, what, you know, is there some sort of environmental source and again Literature suggests that while these can be carried on the hands of healthcare workers, they're hydrophilic and there have been, as I mentioned before, outbreaks associated with hospital water. We also uh, went to the literature and were helped by a, uh, an outbreak that was, uh, had just been published about that time from the Midwest in which a multidrug resistant pseudomonas was detected in a combined medical surgical unit. And indeed, when they looked at their uh, environment, uh, they found that uh, for example, the sink drains, 16% of their sink drains uh, also in medical surgical units, step down unit, and 5.6% on the transplant unit were all uh, contaminated with this multi drug resistant uh, pseudomonas, uh, smaller percentages in the sink taps and shower heads. So we went up and uh, our team went up and looked at the sinks, and this is a typical sink in the North Tower. There's a lot of stuff going on here, as you can see. There's uh, you got tape and all kind of stuff, uh, syringes over here. Um, and the nurses do a lot of activities on these sinks. They'll come in and take an IV bag, for example, and they'll sit it down on the counter over here, and they'll hang the tubing over the, uh, the spout of the sink. And uh, so a lot of activities going on, a lot of splashing going on. And then down here, at least in the ICUs, do you know what's down in, under here? A portable toilet pull out toilet. 
So, uh, so, so a lot of, uh, like I say, a lot of activities going on with these things. And our team, <laughs> our team talked to the nurses about uh, trying to limit the, uh, some of the activities going on on those uh, counters and so forth. Um, so we, uh, we looked at a number of things, looked at our hand hygiene compliance, and of course it was reported very high from the uh, uh, ICUs, but we did audits and they were actually lower, and we always have to work on hand hygiene. Uh, one thing we looked at was uh, to make sure that all the water that was used in things like respiratory equipment and so forth is all uh, sterile water. We don't use any, any tap water for, for those types of uh, functions. And so we decided to do some cultures ourselves as per the literature and look to see uh, what we might find. So we chose the medical and surgical ICUs as the experimental units. And then we took a couple of units, uh, intermediate units that did not have uh, they either had few or no uh, nosocomial infections among their devices as control groups. And we asked uh, our colleagues in the laboratory to start saving some of the uh, gram-negative isolates from the patients. So we took swabs from uh, sinks, uh, again, of two units for experimental and two for control, and we used an outside lab to do the uh, culturing. And so this is what we found, surgical ICU, medical ICU. So of the 17 rooms that had patients uh, on that particular day, 11 of the 17 had positive cultures from the sinks. And you see, you recognize our old friends there, Pseudomonas, uh, Burkholderia, Cepatia, uh, Enterobacter, Klebsiella. And then the uh, medical ICU, 14 beds uh, were filled and we had found Pseudomonas and uh, Burkholderia. So we said, okay, looks like we're on to something. Then we looked at the control units. And these units, of course, are smaller, uh, shorter length of stays in general in, in these units. But to our surprise, we, we found the same organisms in the control units where you didn't have a lot of nose common infections going on. So um, then we went back to the literature and we said, okay, um, is the water supply uh, contaminated or infected with these uh, bacteria? So we looked at different wide uh, fixes. We talked about hospital-wide fixes. The hospital does flush the uh, water system occasionally with hot water. Um, should we filter the water coming in to the hospital? And we were told that was, it, it might be possible, but it was not probable that we could do that with, with the number of gallons that we have coming into the, to the facility. Um, we talked about unit-based fixes, put water, water filters on the individual sink spouts. And so we actually, uh, bought some and looked at them. They look sort of like, a, those of you who have guns, they look like a, a silencer for a gun. And the uh, problem was they were so long that there was no space underneath for, the, <laughs> for anybody to wash their hands or do anything. So, so that didn't work out very well. And, and I think two of the ones we used broke off anyway uh, while they were being tested. Um, we talked about installing splash guards, uh, and that's what was done in the uh, outbreak in the Midwest to uh, decrease contamination. This is what they're their sink and their counter look like in a patient room. They re-engineered, put the sink over on this side, put the counter here, and put up a, uh, a barrier so that you wouldn't get splash uh, from the sinks onto the countertops. And we talked about that, and we'll show you some slides about that later. And then we said, well, or, or we could do some more sampling. So of course, you, you probably figure out what we did. We did some more sampling. Uh, we took additional uh, swabs from the sinks and also looked at the water samples. And to our surprise, we didn't grow much from the water. So uh, we, uh, we grew the, the same organisms we've seen previously. This is surgical ICU. Same organisms we saw previously, but uh, we only found one water sample that had a, a stenotrophomonas in it. So I was sort of scratching my head at this point. I was like, well, I sort of expected to find more from the water. So we, uh, we were wondering, well, okay, where, where are they coming from? Are they just contamination from the patients or, or what? So uh, Dolores Nobles is here. Dolores said, Dr. Andy said, uh, the, the aerators on the spouts are cruddy looking. Some people call them strainers, uh, but the aerators, and if, if you think about it at home where you have your sink uh, in, in the kitchen, the aerator makes the water nice and bubbly when it comes out. You know, makes everybody feel good, looks good. Um, so, uh, we said, well, let's uh, ch check on that. So I asked the uh, plant supervisor, I said, uh, how, how often do y'all change the aerators? You know, and his answer was, <laughs> what aerators? <laughs> uh, 
I said, well, surely you change them sometimes. He said, well, yeah, well, if one of them breaks, yeah, we, we, we replace them. So we, we came to realize very quickly that some of those aerators have been there for the length of time the North Tower had been constructed, <laughs> decades. So, uh, so we said, okay, we looked at the literature, and uh, I remember some things about aerators uh, here and there, you know, how things come and go in the literature. So I uh, found this uh, article in the England Journal of Medicine, Faucet Aerator, Source of Pseudomonas Infection, and there were four cases of surgical site infections, surgical wound infections that had occurred, and uh, that they associated the pseudomonas in the water to the, uh, the aerators <clears throat> and to the patient infections using a very crude form of uh, molecular typing that was available at that time. <clears throat> so the question is, when was this published? Let's see, this was, uh, here, here are the authors, 1966. <laughs> so it's, it's been around, this information's been around a while. Um, so we uh, sent the team up to look at the uh, aerators and do some cultures, additional cultures, and so uh, so this is uh, this is biofilm here on the uh, this is Dolores said, cruddy looking uh, some biofilm here, and uh, then we stuck a sponge up in the uh, spout. <laughs> So uh, when they came back and showed me this picture, I, I had like a Mr. Bill moment, you know. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> so um, so we moved on uh, from there, and uh, I asked the, uh, you know, I was still curious about the water. I was like, we should have found some of these organisms in the water if you got all that biofilm. So I asked them, and they said, well, we did what. The, the folks from the uh, testing lab suggested you did a two-minute runoff before you uh, took the sample. So I said, okay, well, let's do another, let's, let's culture the uh, water sinks and aerators, but this time, as soon as you turn the water on, stick that bottle in there. Don't, don't do the two-minute uh, runoff. And then we sent those out. So what did we find? Uh, again, surgical ICU, we f sort of focused on, I'm not picking on them, we just sort of focused on one unit to do our investigation. Uh, very appreciative of the support from the administration for paying for all these extra cultures. But we found certainly in 417, Pseudomonas in the water and in the aerator, uh, Stenotrophomonas, uh, which we'd found previously in the water and aerator. Uh, no aerators here, um, but uh, at any rate, uh, sort of added to the, uh, to the information. So uh, Kerry Augustino in our infection control lab does the, the genotyping, and so uh, we had genotyping done got the isolates from the uh, clean micro lab and genotyped and a wide variety of patterns were noted among uh, the uh, environment, surgical ICU. We had some controls here, CICU and CICU here, uh, water strainers, sinks um, in the different units. And uh, it's kind of hard to make a lot of sense out of this, but then we did some very specific uh, comparisons where we matched up uh, aerators and sinks from the same room, and indeed they, they showed, uh, we, we, we don't call these identical, we call them indistinguishable. Uh, here's another one aerator in the water uh, from the same room and then an aerator from another room. So we did see some similarities matching up uh, actual aerators and sinks from the same rooms. And then more importantly, uh, we were able to match up some patient uh, clinical samples, uh, clinical isolates. Here's water from a uh, patient room and then the same patient, same room and had a respiratory isolate which was indistinguishable, uh, sink and wound from a, another patient and sink and bloodstream from a third patient. So we did have some matches. A lot have had more matches but we did find certainly a few matches here. And this sort of validates that there is some correlation between the environment and the patients. So a small test of change, uh, we, the aerators were removed from the MICU and SICU pods. Uh, additional pure L dispensers were placed in some of the SICU rooms where they were, it was difficult to, or just not convenient, I guess, to, to wash your hands. We also, uh, our team worked with the nursing staff about disposal of fluids in those uh, toilets underneath. And then the uh, folks from EVS, and I see Jeff Barna and several other folks here from uh, uh, EVS uh, um, brought some additional uh, cleaning methods to, uh, to bear. Uh, detailed cleaning, more frequent wipe down of all surfaces, countertops, and so forth. Uh, and still doing it daily, went to twice a day, more frequent rounds, removal of trash. And Dr. Shack, uh, Dr. Major got on a, a tear about the, uh, 
uh, how cruddy looking it was, uh, the spaces there where the uh, sliding doors are, particularly in MICU and so forth. So um, the, uh, basically they put on a schedule, the doors were actually removed and, and cleaned. Um, and if a patient, uh, and then more recently, if a patient has occupied a room for more than 21 day length of stay, they're moved to another room and the, and the room is, is totally cleaned again. So basically it brought some additional uh, practices to bear. So uh, these, this is a small table here, MICU, SICU, our initial look. Uh, these were the uh, device-related gram-negative infections, January, February, March. The aerators were removed by the end of, uh, end of the month. Uh, April looked pretty good. May came along, we had a couple of infections show up uh, again, SICU. And so we began to understand that the interval between detailed cleanings in these two uh, cases were 74, 98 days, so we probably needed to come up with some sort of a schedule for the detailed cleaning to occur. Month of June, there were no infections. So we went ahead and said, let's go ahead and, and uh, extend this uh, practice to the other uh, areas in the North Hospital, so, uh, so the uh, North Towers. So the sink spouts were cleared, aerators removed from all the remaining ICUs and, IC and IUs. Schedule set up for detailed cleaning. We also um, have experimented with a splash guard in uh, one of the MICU rooms. And this is your typical MICU room uh, sink. And then here's one with a splash guard. Uh, this has only been, just been tested preliminarily. It costs a lot of money to do this, but it costs less than dealing with infections. So uh, uh, I imagine this will be extended at some point. If we look from, say, the 30,000 foot level and say, okay, what's the overall, have we had any impact here? Uh, and again, I haven't broken these down into central lines or VAPs or UTIs, but if we just look at the big picture, and just again in the North Tower, these were our numbers of monthly gram-negative infections. Here was the process change with the removal of aerators, detail cleaning, and except for this little bump right here, which occurred a couple months later, we've had a a nice downward trend. I have not subjected this to statistical analysis yet, but we will do that uh, shortly. And then Pseudomonas makes up about half of that previous graph. And again, as Pseudomonas goes, gram negatives go because it's our major uh, gram negative pathogen. And again, we ha actually have some months where there are no, no Pseudomonas infections at all. So um, that's sort of what's, uh, what's occurred. If we look at the uh, marketplace, uh, there are other things going on. If you go on to do, if those of you that are students going to do residency elsewhere or residents going to do fellowship or work elsewhere, you'll see that there are other practices coming into play. The marketplace is responding with a lot of different uh, ways to try to improve cleaning of the environment. One is the hydrogen peroxide fog vapor. And uh, this has been tested particularly in the Northeast. You have to remove the patient from the room, of course, to do this and seal off the vents and everything. It's a fairly laborious, about a four hour procedure to uh, fog your room with uh, hydrogen peroxide. And it's very effective in killing uh, bacteria. Uh, and studies are now pending in places where they're actually gonna do, have randomized trials going on where they'll, they'll you know, do this to half the room. Every room gets clean, but half the rooms get fogged and then they actually look at whether the decreased numbers of infections occur uh, subsequently between the fogged rooms and the non-fogged rooms. And then closer to home, the folks in uh, Chapel Hill did a study with this uh, uh, UV light. Uh, uh, it's a portable, it looks like something out of Star Wars. I've seen the demos on it and everything. Um, you basically just roll in the room and uh, of course you take the patient out. Uh, and then uh, this is a lot shorter time period. It's like 10 or 15 minutes, you turn it on. And the folks at Chapel Hill did some studies, Bill Rotella and, and David Weber and showed uh, significant reductions in bacterial counts in the rooms after the uh, UV light uh, and, and published that two years ago. Uh, the folks over at Duke have actually got a large grant uh, to do a study. They're doing it at Duke Medical Center as well as five other hospitals. And they're actually looking to see whether they can decrease infect nose colonial infections by using uh, this. And they've got a very big trial set up. So hopefully another year or so uh, we'll have data from their trial uh, I was asked recently, I saw Steve Lawler here earlier, he had uh, emailed me and asked me about this. There's some hospital in South, South Carolina was advertising how this had helped them decrease their infections. Non-peer-reviewed data, by the way. Um, and so uh, my comment was, this may be an adjunctive type of thing 
you still have to clean the room. I mean, you got to debulk the room of, of dirt and so forth. Uh, so it may be something that as we try to push to zero nose cone infections, it may be an adjunctive type tool, but these things cost $100,000 each. So uh, don't, don't, I don't think we can, we can afford a fleet of them, but you might have a couple that you can move around in some sequence. Uh, so, th so like I say, you may see some of these at other places and we may see them here at some point. The question is what can you do to uh, of course, help prevent uh, spread of infections. Number one is we need 100% hand hygiene compliance uh, and also 100% compliance with uh, precautions. Certainly, if you go in a room and see, uh, if you, as you make rounds or go see individual patients that the room is dirty, you know, go speak to the charge nurse or head nurse about it and they'll call the folks from EVS, get that clean. Sometimes things occur during the day that uh, you know, nurse or EVS are not aware of. So. Uh, Certainly don't, don't hesitate to, uh, to be an advocate and give them a call. And then finally, uh, certainly to help uh, throughput, uh, there's a lot of pressure here to get patients uh, out and new patients in. And so if you can, and I'm not the only one that's beating this drum, but certainly if you uh, can work on your discharge planning such that the patients can be discharged earlier in the day, it gives the uh, folks from EVS more time to get those rooms cleaned uh, and help, help protect the uh, next patient that comes to that room. Certainly want to acknowledge uh, a lot of folks uh, helped us with the uh, latter part of this, uh, the, the data that we presented at the end. The, Dr. Christie, Ruth Etheridge, and Erica and crew from uh, Clean Micro, environmental services team. We'll see who, who all is here today. I see uh, Melvin, Greg, uh, Jeff, so forth. Advanced testing laboratory on the outside. And then we have our infection control team of uh, practitioners. Bill Cleave uh, watches after, uh, looking for, is always looking for cases of Legionella and for uh, Aspergillus and his role as the uh, epidemiologist and Kerry Augustino did all the, the genotyping for us. So with that I'm going to stop and see what kind of questions you have. Thank you very much for your attendance this morning.